Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 25th of October of 2020, and the article that I'm going to be using as a citation was published on the 21st of October of 2020. Please check out this article for yourself, and don't trust me, this is not a medical recommendation as to how you should take care of your COVID patients. The title of the article is, Aspirin Use is Associated with Decreased Mechanical Ventilation, ICU Admission, and inpatient mortality in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Now let's answer the first question that academic elites will ask you the moment we even think about providing aspirin empirically to our COVID patients. And when I say academic elites, I mean these these individuals, because some would say that I'm academic based on all my social media work and all that I read. But there are these people who practice medicine who only provide certain interventions to their patients if there is a randomized control trial that reflects that there's some benefit to the treatment. And the first question is, is there a prospective randomized control trial to show that aspirin decreases the severity of COVID? Well, the answer to that question is a resounding no. There's no data from a randomized control trial that it does work. So if you want to go ahead and bash this post, bash this podcast, bash this paper, you can go ahead and do so. You, you, you stand on stable ground to do so. But at the same time, I invite you to go to clinicaltrials.gov, which is the website where all the clinical trials throughout the world are registered, and go ahead and look up aspirin and COVID. You're going to be in a, you're going to be very surprised that you're going to see pretty much zero results, which means that no one is seriously looking at prospectively studying this. And that means that if this treatment does work, because again, one of the main limitations to the study that I'm going to be discussing today is the fact that it's retrospective. But that means that if this treatment does work, we will possibly never know. And that means many patients may not ever benefit from receiving aspirin during their course of hospitalization because nobody has ever studied this. That's that's just mind-boggling to me because, again, medicine is a practice and we just got to do the best we can for our patients with our given knowledge. That being said, I'm not recommending aspirin for our COVID patients, and I'll give you a little bit more insight as to why I feel that way as this podcast continues. So then the question becomes, are we going to be these people who have our heads so far up our backside waiting for a randomized control trial that we will never at least even try something that mechanistically should work and lose patience in the process? And this is where I say that we need to have informed consent with our patients when we're doing things that are off-label. We do a lot of things in medicine that are off-label and not supported by randomized controlled trials. But these people who want to just shun all this data and they want to, they're basically the same people who want to keep everybody indoors, business closed indefinitely, and say, follow the science like religious, like a religious mantra. And at the same time, ignore that there is a complete lack of studies that are not involving some sort of monoclonal antibody, some expensive therapy that's the studies being sponsored by Big Pharma or drugs that are being resurrected from the dead, kind of like remdesivir is. But that being said, I am not in favor of putting aspirin in the drinking water of our COVID patients just yet. I'm more so saying that we are not, we, the NIH, and I've covered this before on social media, I don't know if I, I can't recall if I've covered it here on the podcast, but the NIH, our taxpayer money, is going to funding a lot of studies <laughs> that and a lot of institutions that are not putting out real-world studies for, for our COVID patients. But rant aside, let's, let's go ahead and actually do what we came to do with this podcast, which is to dig into this paper. And as I potentially mentioned before, it was published in Anesthesia and Analgesia. As a matter of fact, I know some of the people who are the authors of this trial, and they're, they're good people. But ultimately, don't trust me. Read the article for yourself. It's, it's listed in the show notes. It's completely free for you to download. It's also on my website. The authors here state some mechanisms as well as some rationales for the hyper, hypercoagulation that we're seeing in our COVID patients. You know, the fact that they go ahead and develop DVTs, PEs, uh, they cloud up their CRT cartridges, you know, they have CVAs, et cetera, et cetera. Any of us who have taken care of COVID patients are really, really aware of this phenomenon. I mean, it's, it's quite scary. And many of them, many of us, including myself, are, of course, with informed consent, therapeutically coagulating, anticoagulating these patients based on our best judgment to mitigate the, pro, the prothrombotic phase of this disease until it passes. 
So, so if you really want to chuckle here, you know, many of us are doing this at our institutions and I, I, I really challenge you to go up and go and look at the evidence of, for example, Lovenox versus no anticoagulation in COVID patients, randomized control trial or heparin versus not, no heparin, I, <laughs> therapeutic dose versus prophylactic dose. Go ahead and look for that. Look for that data. You're, you're really not going to find it. But here, what the authors did is that they performed a retrospective study looking at aspirin with the need for mechanical ventilation as the primary objective. In other words, was being on aspirin something protective from being placed on a ventilator? And the other objectives were reducing the risk for ICU admission as well as in hospital mortality. And they went ahead and found that people who were either on aspirin in the seven days prior to hospital admission or provided aspirin in the first 24 hours of admission, those patients were categorized as being aspirin users, and those patients overall did better. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and dive into the statistical jumping jacks that authors did in order to obtain these numbers. They're, they're in the article. I don't want to talk about chi squared tests and all that stuff because you would definitely tune out. I can't possibly go over every single number, in fact, from the study, but overall they had 412 patients in the study. Only about a quarter of them, 98, were in the aspirin arm. And the dose of aspirin that was provided to these patients was just 81 milligrams daily. It's not like they were receiving 325 or 650 or something obscene or anything like that. But something that would modify the outcomes are, you know, patients who we see do poorly in our ICUs. You know, the patients or in our hospitals, for that matter. You know, patients who have diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, etc. Well, the patients in the aspirin arm obviously had more of these comorbidities than the non-aspirin users. But interestingly enough, the patients who were non-aspirin users were sicker on admission. In other words, they were receiving more high flow nasal cannula, non-rebreather, or uh, CPAP or BiPAP to manage your oxygenation. Interesting also is that their QSOFA scores were the same in both groups on admission. However, the Apache 2 scores were higher on ICU admin in the aspirin groups. Now, something we see and something a lot of us check are fibrinogen as well as D-dimers to kind of have an idea of what their coagulation cascade is doing, or in other words, how it's misbehaving. And it was interesting to see that in both groups, the D-dimer and the use of therapeutic heparin was the same in both groups. Again, the use of therapeutic heparin is uh, not substantiated by the randomized control trial, guys, at least to my knowledge. So all in all, when they did all their statistical jumping jacks and all their analyses and all those things that the common person does not understand, what was it that they found in COVID patients who received aspirin? Well, first of all, they found that these, pa these patients had a decreased risk of mechanical ventilation. That was their primary objective. Then in their secondary objectives, they found that they had a decreased risk of ICU admission. That means fewer patients were transferred from the floor to the ICU or from the step down to the ICU. And then lastly, there was a decreased risk of in-hospital mortality in patients who received aspirin. And I know a lot of you might be saying, hey, those things are, those things are good, enough, uh, good enough data to actually start giving aspirin to all of, our, all of our patients. But this is where I encourage you to go ahead and check out the limitations to the study because the authors typically confess the shortcomings to their paper. One of the things that really caught my eye was that 51, excuse me, 53.1% of the patients who were in the aspirin arm were on room air, which leads me to wonder, why in the world were hospitalized patients uh, on room air on admission? I mean, what, what, would, what would actually say, hey, we need to admit this person? But overall, I digress. But we need to look at this some more. Ultimately, I don't think that the answer is that we should start putting it in the, in the water of our COVID patients. But I believe, and again, this is not, not medical advice, this is my opinion. I believe that if somebody doesn't have a primary care doctor and they were never placed on aspirin and they have a bunch of risk factors to be on aspirin, I believe that they should be started on aspirin in the hospital because why not? You know, I know that there's a lot of people who uh, are weary of starting people who might be on dexamethasone anyway because they are oxygen requirement, oxygen requiring and dexamethasone is the only treatment right now that we know improves mortality. So people might say, hey, you know, aspirin plus dexamethasone and the big uh, GI bleed question lights up in their head. 
But then we got to wonder, hey, could we give these people fomotidine for, for GI prophylaxis as, you know, there there is some uh, data out there, which I guess I could cover it here on the podcast in these upcoming days as to how fomotidine could also mechanistically improve outcomes in COVID patients, even though that is, again, not supported by a randomized control trial. And I am not, I am not recommending you do that at this point. But, you know, that's just, that's just a different take for there. Um, a lot of what I'm doing here in this, in this particular podcast is kind of like a call to arms where we look into actually conducting randomized control trials with cheap, inexpensive, uh, readily available. Cheap and inexpensive mean the same thing. What I mean is uh, cheap, safe, and readily available therapies that will go ahead and improve outcomes and not be not be too laborious to study because you know it's um it's, it's something that we need we need results for sooner rather than later i mean we we have to know how to take care of these people the best we can and right now we're just throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks over i think that's that's enough for this podcast i hope you guys have a great day thank you for your support I appreciate uh, those of you who have clicked on the Audible link in the description box below and signed up for your free trial where you get one free book if you're not an Amazon Prime member and two free books with your, if you, uh, I don't know if I said that right, but if you are not an Amazon Prime member, you get one book for free. And if you are an Amazon Prime member, you get two books for free. And I get a little bit of compensation on the tail end of that. Again, thanks everybody for your support. Hope you all have a great day.